The first workshop for the day is titled Scaling Up. This workshop would provide MSMEs at the growth phase of their trajectory with strategies for scaling up their businesses. I would like to invite Mr. Arun Patnayak, co-founder, CEO and director, Absus IT and member NASCOM SME Council to set the context for this workshop and also introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Subroto Bhakchi to all of you. Welcome Arun sir. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Subroto Bhakchi to talk with us on this topic of scaling up for IT SMEs. India's IT sector is set to become a $227 billion industry in financial year 2022, registering a 15.5% growth, which is the highest in over a decade. Furthermore, NASCOM's internal research clearly sees an ability to reach $350 billion in revenue by 2026. This would require massive scaling up at multiple levels. Scaling up specifically for IT SMEs can be a great challenge. And, and we have Mr. Bakshi with us to provide some insights and words of wisdom. Friends, let me introduce Mr. Subroto Bakshi. Mr. Bakshi is first of all, an amazing human being. And anyone who knows him personally would know that he's a man of great compassion, love, humility, and genuinely interested in the well-being of others. His ability to connect with everyone and everything from his very childhood days, be it his primary school, his teachers, his friends, colleagues, and associates is expansive. Mr. Bakshi is one of the well-known business leaders in India, having co-founded one of the most admired IT companies, Mindtree. Mindtree today is a billion dollar plus company with more than 23,000 employees worldwide. Mr. Bakshi is a well-known writer with bestsellers like The High Performance Entrepreneur, Go Kiss the World, The Professional, MBA at 16, The Elephant Catches, which talks about scaling up and sell. Mr. Bakshi is currently the chairman of the Odisha Skill Development Authority. He has led the creation of a brand, Skill in Odisha. He has made Odisha a sandbox for innovation in creating the Nano Unicorn Program, under which skilled youth are matched with philanthropic capital to start small businesses instead of becoming job seekers. Mr. Bakshi, along with his writer wife, Sushmita, are well-known philanthropists, always doing their best for the society and humanity at large. Mr. Bakshi is a visionary, a mentor, a guide, and always a friend for the young and aspiring IT fraternity. This session will be in two parts. The first part of the session will be some questions structured around challenges that IT SMEs face while scaling up. And we look forward to your kind words of wisdom and, and advice, sir. Before we conclude the session, we'll have a rapid fire of 10 questions for Mr. Bakshi to answer. Sir, I will request you to address the audience briefly after which we can immediately get started with the Q&A session. Over to you, sir. So thank you once again uh, for inviting me for this uh, conclave. And, uh, you know, it would have been so much nicer to be in the same room with all of you. Um, it's always, <clears throat> despite the last two years of lockdown and uh, despite all of us trying to do this uh, blended stuff, um, online uh, webinars and so on, it still does not feel the same way that uh, one could be um, feeling when one is face to face. But nonetheless, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was very happy when I was told that this will be largely a uh, question-led session. And I don't want to take a long time to pontificate. Um, I think the engagement is best uh, when uh, people lead by questions. I have always uh, felt that um, when you look at setting up an enterprise, uh, you basically have to continuously focus on uh, the following things. First and foremost, you have to be very focused on the domain in which you operate. Um, <clears throat> it's not enough to be focused on the domain, but people must have clarity on your domain. People meaning your customers and your employees and your 
other stakeholders like your investors a lot of people actually uh, have lack of clarity on what domain they belong to so domain is very important the second thing that is uh, very critical is uh, <clears throat> use of tools uh, typically small companies medium sized companies don't take it very seriously and tool becomes an afterthought as tools are very important because they uh, pretty much define uh, who you are and i always tell people that uh, tools have an anthropological context so if you look at different tribes in the world uh, you can tell which tribe is which by looking at their tools so the spears and the arrows and the bows and the tents of one tribe in um, africa would be very different from those uh, in north america or those in uh, northeast part of india why that's very important is <clears throat> uh, tools bind your own people together tools give us the distinctive you know ways of doing things in a predictable way the other very important thing about tools is that without tools you cannot scale you know the kind of tools that you choose early on in your life uh, pretty much will define how much you will scale if this is sounding too abstract let, let me give you an example you know a lot of us <clears throat> uh, will not invest in an erp or they will say that you know i can pretty much manage uh, my business with a home grown erp or i'll do it with excel sheets you know i'll do it uh, a cheap and cheerful software that i will buy from my brother in law company now when we are setting up mind tree and we are less than 100 people less than 100 people mind you we said that we must uh, actually um, run this company pretending that we are a very large company and from the beginning itself we will actually implement an erp we'll run the company on the strength of a proven erp so we started life with oracle and uh, at that time i'm talking about 1999 uh, not many erps you know were uh, very service centric service company centric so erps were basically for manufacturing companies so we didn't have a perfect solution but we knew that this oracle erp that we are implementing will be good for us for the first few years and in 3 to 5 years we had taken a decision that will scrap whatever we have and go for the next higher scalable erp at that point in time um which will be by the time there will be evolution in terms of how erp companies will come up in the services sector I, the reason i'm giving this example is that when you run an entire enterprise on the basis of a shared tool like an erp system you are actually driving many things you're driving discipline in the organization you are driving the capability to you know to close your books of account the day that your month ends you can on demand produce a credible book why is that important it is very important because that is what gives transparency and that is what will impress your investor but no this is not what will be intuitively clear to many people who will not think about the tools the same thing is with an let's say human resource management system a learning management system within the organization one can go on and on and on it's not just the erp so first is clarity about your domain second is you know clarity about using tools because tools help you to scale you can't go to war uh, without the right tools you know uh, sorry i shouldn't be talking about war right now but you know any form of competition you know, in instead of war we should talk about running a marathon uh, biking you know um, arun here is very fond of biking so before he starts biking he exercises himself so this bike is a tool his bike dismantling tools are tools his clothing is tools down to the water bottle that he will carry so he accessorizes himself so the question is it's not an afterthought the question is in an organization context what are the tools that make you stand apart the third thing 
is which is i think is very critical is uh, clarity uh, about an investment in methodology so tools uh, are the things with which we run our business the methodology is the unique how to okay so to give you an example uh, if you look at uh, mckinsey or if you look at bain or you look at price waterhouse you look, look at kpmg all these companies have their own way of doing things that is their methodology is their intellectual property so you may be manufacturing software you may be in it services business you may be doing you know uh, food delivery but if your methodology is not different from other people and if that methodology is not clearly understood and practiced practiced by everybody in the organization then it'll not scale now let me explain this to you let us say that you are operating let's say you are a food delivery company in bangalore now scaling up here means that you have to do it now in hyderabad the way that you do your food delivery fulfillment has to be replicable that comes if the organization at very senior levels is focusing on methodology building your own unique methodology so if you look at uh, you know how a mckinsey will do diagnostics for example is going to be different inherently from how a bain will do it if you look at mckinsey's slides all over the world you will find that the moment you see their slides you know it's a mckinsey slide or a bain slide the way that a mckinsey consultant will engage with you in australia is very similar to how they will engage with you in north america the same thing applies to us whatever may be our business and who actually thinks about methodology top management does not think about methodology we are doing things by heroics and even as you are not doing things by heroics and somewhat you have uh, got a reasonable methodology you don't think of documenting it you don't think about revising it periodically you don't think about training people consciously the day that they sign up to join your company so your domain your tools your methodology fourth is quality now what is quality quality is basically value perceived by the customer it is not what you think it is it is value perceived by a customer the interesting thing however is that the customer perception is a very fickle thing we think that quality is generally something that you revisit periodically but today the customer has got so many choices the customer may you know love you enormously for who you are today but day after tomorrow that perception will change and the customer may not even inform you about that what we need to understand is that quality is not a static thing quality has three positions either you are quality positive or you are quality neutral or you are quality negative obviously if you are quality positive it's very good and that has to be continuously exponentially different it is like having uh, it's not enough to have a great uh, if you are apple it's not enough to or a samsung it's not enough to have a great uh, phone but you need to think through the next three phones or four phones or five phones and those have to be inherently different in terms of form and functionality so that's a paying attention to quality but it's very good if you are in that position where you have a quality road map of everything that you do going forward you have a mental picture of what it will be 18 months 36 months from now but many of us remain quality neutral which basically means that you are living on yesterday's reputation the danger of being quality neutral is that you quickly become quality negative and then you are out of consideration so it's a treadmill you know you cannot stay still in one place when it comes to quality and for you to understand that quality is value perceived by the customer we need to continuously go back and look at what is the customer thinking so we need to listen to the voice of the customer 
But unfortunately, the customer's voice is like an iceberg. And many times what the customer says is not what the customer means. So you have to practice deep listening skills. That's very critical. We need to look at competition continuously. We need to actually go downstream, not just looking at the needs of the customer, but the customer's customer. When you engage with your customer's customer, that is where you will actually understand where is the pain point of the customer. And if you can't address the, what I call the unstated needs of the customer, if you're fulfilling the stated needs, then uh, you are me too. But are you able to actually fulfill the unstated needs of your customer? So I talked to you about domain tools, methodology, quality. The next important point to keep in mind is innovation. Now, we think that innovation is something that happens in spurts, but you need to understand that innovation has to be a managed process in the organization. Innovation has to be a culture and everybody in the organization must know what is the essence of innovation? How do you innovate? Now, innovation requires a soft infrastructure. It needs basically innovation stems from creativity. And for people to have creativity, people need to have a soft infrastructure in the organization. The job of top management then is to create that soft infrastructure where people feel free, people feel good about connecting with each other. There is uh, emphasis on learning. There's emphasis on sharing of learning. There is celebration of uh, every small innovation, not just the large innovations. Innovation essentially is your ability to answer this very simple question. Every quarter, CEO downwards, whoever I meet in the corridor, and if I shoot a question to you, hey, what's new and different this quarter, that person without blinking an eye should be able to say that. Okay. Now, it, it did not be something very, you know, earth shattering. Somebody may just say, a CEO may say, oh, you know what's new and different this quarter? I have learned a new hobby. You know what's new and different this quarter? I have quit smoking. You know what's new and different this quarter? I have started reading fiction. So it doesn't have to be something which is related to work. So is there a culture of exploring in the organization? Are people humming about their exploration? And going back to the example of a tool, you know, many organizations do not have any idea about the fact that you need to invest in tools that help the organization to be innovative. Okay. So I told you about domain tool, methodology, quality, and innovation. The next important point is to focus on branding. You know, SMEs actually become very under uh, invested in branding. They tend to have uh, mental blocks. They also not only have mental blocks, mental blocks like, you know, is, is this something where it's worth spending money. Do I need to myself learn about branding, brand management and marketing? Do I have a PR agency? Have I personally been trained by the PR agents on how to speak, how to communicate? Now, do I invest time in looking at the branding strategy of competitors? Do I look at branding strategy of non-competitors? You know, what is it that I can learn from all these people? The branding is partly a science, partly an art, and partly it is witchcraft. Okay. Before you get the witchcraft right, you first have to understand the art and the science. Now, if you look at the inherent uh, reality of branding, it is not about making empty claims. I define branding as the externalization of inner value created. So you first have to clearly understand what is the inner value that day in and day out you're creating. 
not just for your customers. It could be for your own people. It could be for your other stakeholders. So how do you first make inventory of your inner value? And how do you externalize those so that the world outside is able to grant you what is called reputational capital? Now, I'm going to wind down this one-way conversation in two minutes, but I'm going to make a very important point at this time. You will find that tons and tons of startup companies actually break through the sound barrier and they go above the clouds and they do phenomenally well with a clearly defined domain investment in tools, methodology, quality, they're extremely innovative. They get the branding right, you know. And, you know, these are the days of the flamboyant CEO or startup uh, founder who uh, will be, you know, who sometimes you feel that are these guys in business or these guys are actually, you know, party animals, but whatever it is, they do a damn good job of hogging the pink papers. Okay? But yet something suddenly goes wrong. And I don't need to give you names. Every week, the newspaper will tell you that one more brilliant founder with all the right credentials, all the right amount of money has actually committed suicide, you know, has basically hung himself or herself in public square and has become yesterday. This suicide is not a physical suicide. It is basically, you know, you kill your own own potential, your own success, because you don't pay attention to governance. Governance is extremely, extremely important. And typically SMEs don't pay attention to governance because you think it is non-trivial. You think that, oh, so I'll put policies in place. I will put audits in place. I will actually get a coach, mentor, guide for myself. I will pay attention to the issue of integrity. I'll pay my taxes right after some time. Okay. Governance cannot be an afterthought. Governance becomes your DNA. The number of people blowing up every day because of poor governance is just mind blowing. And it starts with a small mistake, one mistake at a time. And typically it happens from CEO downwards. It's not just about, you know, the, uh, uh, the the uh, sexual uh, you know transgression uh, by the founder the CEO it is not about fudging the bills it is not just about you know uh, doing uh, uh, insider trading and all that kind of stuff uh, the the problem begins when the founder uh, the CEO actually begins to look at the business as my own uh, its business is my own property. Your business is not your own property. Business has its own body, its own soul, and you are an enabler. So the assets of the business are not your assets. The money in the business is not your own money. You, you, know, you take whatever reasonable salary that will pass scrutiny of governance, and uh, that's, what, that's, that's the money that belongs to you. So... You, the moment you start thinking that the organization is proprietary to you, the moment you start thinking that the assets belong to you, then that is where governance begins to fail. The other important thing is, of course, uh, you know, people bring in friends and family, which is okay. You know, great uh, organizations in the world are sometimes family run. BMW is a family run company. Okay. It's one of the greatest companies that you, you have ever seen. Uh, but uh, even if you have your wife in the organization or your husband in your organization or your daughter or son in the organization, you need to make sure that your family ties are not tying up the organization. Okay. So how do you manage to create transparency and governance what are the chances that if your spouse is messing up, that your subordinate will come and report the matter to you? Okay. 
So how do you draw that line? Now, the moment you start actually thinking that your organization is your, uh, is your property, or you start bringing in friends and family, uh, governance begins to erode. Now, governance is not just about, uh, you know, being good. Uh, governance, again, has its roots in tools and methodology, which enable a certain consistency of practice. If you don't have the right tools and the right methodologies, if you're not, you know, training yourself and training the organization, Culture will not take care of itself. So it is not a warm and fuzzy thing. It is not a soft thing. It is actually uh, something which requires the correct digital infrastructure, investment in the digital infrastructure, in the right methodologies and processes. And you can get the expertise, all these areas that I talked about, you know, domain tool, methodology, quality, innovation, branding, and governance, all these things taken, all these things require expert handling. You cannot be good at these things by yourself. You continuously look at where is the expertise on this. And then what happens? You are an SME. So you say, I'm too small. You know, I'm just a five pro company. I cannot afford an expert on branding. I cannot afford an expert on governance, you know. But what stops you from talking to three other friends who also are two crore, five crore, 20 crore company and saying that let's pull together and learn together and let's engage and share. Many times you'll be surprised how you can actually uh, pull together and uh, create resources which can make a difference. Okay. But many times it is not even that. It is about, uh, you know, it is about your willingness to continuously learn yourself. Typically, uh, founders postpone learning. Okay. And they love to learn about what they already know. So I'm a great hacker. So, you know, I will keep going deeper into technology. I'm a great sales guy. So I will not learn about human resource development. I'm a you know, great people-oriented person, but I freeze when making a sales pitch to a prospect. Okay. So at the top, there has to be a continuous process of learning where the top management of the company leaves the comfort of what you do behind and create discomfort for yourself. Only when you create discomfort for yourself that uh, you are able to uh, learn new things. And when you learn new things, the organization gets the signal that they have to learn new things. So scaling is a very deep and complex thing. And you don't scale by attending a conference like this. You scale by scaling. You scale by doing. And you make enormous amount of mistakes as you go along. You have to be inherently comfortable. And here is my last point before I turn it over to Arun. Uh, the big problem for many small and medium companies is that you have actually tasted success. So you, you know, you started your company in a tier two town, you did it in Bhopal and Chandigarh and in Shimoga. And you had a little bit of struggle in the first one year, two year, five years, and then you became successful. And suddenly you find that you have a 15 crore, 20 crore, 50 crore company. And that company is profitable. Um, you know, even if you take a long weekend off, uh, you know that the customers are the same customers, the more or less the employees are the same, uh, the uh, business makes money. Uh, so you begin to actually raise a family, you start playing golf, and you take your uh, vacation in Europe, uh, and, and, you know, uh, Far East, uh, alternatively, every year. And uh, then it starts sucking you in. Uh, before you know, 20 years have gone by. <clears throat> I can guarantee to you, I know so many people who, uh, before they know, you know, this uh, reasonable degree of success has created a cozy feeling for themselves. 
I met uh, <clears throat> two entrepreneurs in Bangalore um, just uh, the other day. Uh, very uh, financially successful. They run a 100 crore company. Uh, extremely profitable, about 20% PAT. Very niche area. They provide uh, architectural design support to companies in North America. And the two friends are very... Um, you know, they, they are like twins, <clears throat> which is itself very interesting because most companies will fail in the first one year because founders part ways. And here are two founders who have been through the thick and thin. And uh, the company is not going anywhere anymore. Okay. So um, <clears throat> there is business. Business is booming. Okay. And while they're at that 100 crore level, their competition is... You know, the nearest competition is at 500 crore, 800 crore, 1,000 crore level. So you say, uh, how do you, you know, now you're at an inflection point. How do you go to the next level? So the instant thought that comes to their mind is, oh, I have to actually expand uh, into other markets. I have to appoint salespeople because all the business so far has come from our own contacts. And we need new contacts. So as you discuss this, you quickly realize that they are imagining in their mind a world in which uh, other people will do the selling. They don't have to do the selling anymore. Now, I was telling them that uh, where are your most customers? So one of them said that uh, our oldest and biggest customers are in Canada and in US. So I said, then what are you doing in Bangalore? If you want your company to change now for the next 10 years, then one of the two of you has to relocate. The golden rule is you cannot be, you know, you cannot be 10,000 kilometers away from your customer. You have to be in the same time zone as your customer. Now for that, you have to dismantle your life. So my child is going to an international school. I'm playing my golf. I have my car and I have my partner and I you know, have a comfortable life. If that is the path, then you will not be able to break it down so that you can build again. Businesses must be dismantled once in every five years. If businesses must be dismantled once in five years, the CEO must dismantle herself or himself once in four years. So you have to be in a new place. You have to learn a new thing. You have to have a new way of doing things. You have to have new friends. You have to have new hobbies. So until and unless you are continuously reinventing yourself, you will. it is very unlikely that you will be able to reinvent and push the rigor and energy and urgency of reinvention to your next level. And only when you push that to your next level, that the organization will catch the fever. So with those words, uh, let me now hand it back to Arup, Arun. And Arun, please lead the way. So thank you, sir. I think uh, extremely relevant uh, points for the SME sector and, uh, and especially it is uh, very concerning when you know after achieving so much just because of the governance issue things blow apart and uh, this is not a good thing to happen and it is a very very right input for all the SME fraternity to take note of and uh, you know practice some some of these uh, points which sir has said so, so the SME sector is essentially a diverse group. There are many organizations that are owner-led. The owner generally have the right vision and the tenacity to start and get the organization to a certain level. In the context of scaling up, how do you view professionalizing the organization from an owner-led to a professionally-led organization? We have numerous cases of professionals losing sight of the original vision and mission and focusing on short-term outlook. While on the other end of the spectrum, there are cases of owners continuing the growth story successfully. Give us your views on what you believe is on balance the right approach. No, I think uh, the best way that you can, uh, you know, build a 
build your own script on this issue is by looking at companies that have been able to do it well. You don't need to hear it from me and it's not like four mantras I will give you and you will be fine. So look at Wipro, for example. You know, Wipro even today is largely owned by Mr. Premji. And Wipro has uh, five, last I knew, it had five different very uh, unrelated businesses. Okay. So Mr. Premji himself is not competent in any of those businesses. Mr. Premji has never written a single line of code. Okay. Uh, so he's got a software business, he's got a hardware business, he's got um, you know, um, vegetable oil business, hydraulic pneumatic business, all kinds of things. He has been able to build that business because he has one very core competency, critical competency, and that is about surrounding himself with people who are more competent than he is. So it's a very big mindset issue. Most uh, founders will be very uncomfortable in having smart people smarter than them in the company. So Premji wouldn't have been able to come where he has if he had to be the smartest person in the company. He brought in consciously people smarter than him. Now there's, there's a problem here. The moment you think about bringing somebody smarter than you, why should that person come and work for you? You know, that person, if smart enough, will know that you, uh, you know less than that person does. So that person will sense a greater ability in you, must see that you have something that person doesn't have because high performers typically like to work for people who, uh, you know, who they admire. If they don't admire, then they will not work. So what will make somebody admire you while you are not competing with that person for the kind of competency that is required in the company? The second thing that happens, so you have to sell yourself and you have to sell your company to that individual. And <clears throat> when we try to bring that person in, we try to justify bringing in an average or sometimes mediocre guy saying that I can't afford anything better than this. Okay. You have to be able to say, how can I afford some, the best? What personal sacrifice do I need to be able to bring somebody who's outstanding to join me? The second important thing is the moment you bring in smart people, uh, you have to be prepared to get a mouthful from them. Okay. They will not put up with nonsense if they're good enough. So they will speak back to you. They'll disagree with you. Even if they don't speak back, they'll disagree with you. So how do you give them the comfort that they will open their mind? How will you give them comfort that they will have this space? You hire a marketing guy and then you are breathing down that guy's neck. You hire a production guy and then you are actually double guessing that guy. So how do you give them the self-confidence that they can disagree with you? That goes back to the governance thing that I talked about. Governance in the organization makes people feel comfortable. That it is not one person's whims and fancy. It's not you and your spouse were running, but there's an underlying way of doing things. There's an underlying governance in which uh, people's voice will be heard. There's a transparency. Very and, and, and people are continuously watching you. Uh, on how you react to them, you know, how much, how you give space, how you disagree, how much deep listening that you do, how respectful you are when, uh, you know, they have a point of view, how much space you are willing to give. So if you hit their knuckle, you, you get a new marketing guy, that guy makes one mistake and immediately you hit that guy's knuckle and the rest of the organization will actually go, uh, they will cringe and they will go and hide in the shadows and nobody else will do anything that uh, will not meet your approval. And there goes the organization scale. So 
I have to continuously say when I walk into my office every morning, you know, are my people taller than me? If I'm the smartest guy, if I'm the handsomest dude in the office, then you know what? Uh, you are surrounded by dwarfs. So how do I surround myself with people smarter, handsomer, more competent, okay? Sometimes more brash than I am. This requires what is called letting go. And that's not easy. Definitely. And I think that is where a lot of uh, SMEs struggle. But this is the path that they must adapt to scale up. And uh, the second question, sir, to you is SMEs face uh, several levels of challenges in scaling up due to increased cost of resources such as skilled people, quality infrastructure, availability of fund. As you are aware, 2021 is referred to as the year of the big resignation and moonlighting is a new cause of concern. In the current situation, the cost of businesses is significantly going higher. The SMEs have to scale under such adversities. The question really is, is it really a mindset issue or a resource issue? What's your idea of scaling up? So I'll, I'll tell you something, you know, um... A uh, couple of things. Uh, don't sympathize with yourself. That's the starting point. You know, I am an SME, so the big guy, the big whales are there, you know, out to eat my catch. And, uh, you know, because I am neither small nor big, uh, the whole system is against me. Uh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Now, remember, every large company was once an SME. Okay. And this is not the first time that, uh, you know, a country like Russia is invading Ukraine and you are feeling the pinch of it. They, at any point in time, there'll be a crisis. Business is about crisis. And every crisis is actually an opportunity. So the starting point for me is to say that uh, I'm not going to sympathize with myself. So that is the inherent challenge. You will never get a level playing field. Business is not about a level playing field. And only if, let, let me put it very bluntly and simply, only if you are every morning getting up and asking yourself, what did I do on domain, tool, methodology, quality, innovation, branding, and governance, only when you do that day in and day out, over a period of time, you will build resilience. Okay. Right. Sorry, but it is a little like doing yoga. Or it's a little like going to the gym. You know, health is an outcome of how you are handling your own body and your own mind, day in and day out. You can't be seasonal about it. So I'll give you an example here. I went to Japan in the 1990s to get trained on quality, in quality. And uh, at that time, um, I happened to visit a few uh, suppliers of Toyota. One of the suppliers of Toyota happened to be a company called Araco. They make seats for Toyota and they make recreational vehicle for Toyota, vehicles for Toyota. So they are practically dependent on Toyota for their entire business. And in some ways, there's some, you know, holding that Toyota has in Araco. But Toyota gives them a hard time, real hard time, because every year Toyota wants them to reduce their price by 20% to Toyota. In quality, increase efficiencies but decrease the price the non-negotiable every year they'll come back and say last year this much so this year 20 percent less so theoretically at some point in time you have to be completely free okay so araco has to figure out ways of how to give the benefit pass on the benefit to toyota and at the same time actually remain profitable. And the only way that they can do it is by finding newer values, newer way of doing things. Now, why does Toyota do this? Because the Japanese, if you remember, for a long, long, long period of time have been a, you know, a zero uh, inflation country. Okay. It's a standstill thing. 
right? In fact, there are times when you have deflation. So the only way that you can be profitable and competitive in a situation like that is if you're continuously taking inefficiencies out of the system. And secondly, if you're continuously actually driving yourself through innovation. So if you look at that pressure, it's a huge pressure. Now they do it because their principle is that every company should do what they call recession proofing. Imagine that the recession is going to happen. So your manpower deployment, your, your equipment deployment, your processes, your way of going and acquiring customers, everything you presume will happen in a worse situation than what it is now. So if you have, in other words, you know, the Indian Air Force had uh, signboards outside its um, cantonments. Uh, I remember growing up reading them that's, that would say that if you sweat in peace, you will not bleed in war. People who do not do that sweating in peace will be completely uncomfortable. Then they will blame everybody else. Then they'll go into inaction. So what is in your control? In your control is day in and day out focus on those seven things that I talked about. Once you have the dashboard and you're holding us accountable and every morning getting up and saying, so on these seven things, what am I going to do today? You'll find an ups and downs will happen. Bad competition will come. Market will crumble. Wars will happen. You know, you talked about, you know, employees doing moonlighting. And that's a reality, uh, you know, that's not just hurting you, that's hurting all the big guys as well. So you need to accept that, you know, it is like that book that you must have read about who moved my cheese. The cheese has moved. Okay. Right. Now you are not complaining that you actually saved on electricity bills and air conditioning cost, okay, during the pandemic. So that went straight into your bottom line, okay. You saved on travel. You saved on so many different things. So you're not complaining about that, but what you're complaining is suddenly this uh, dude, this, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, you know, spiky haired guy is running two shift in his apartment. Morning, he works for company A, evening, he works for company B. Okay. But look, you know, welcome to new reality. That is the reality. So how will you actually engage with that dude despite this change where he's not contaminating your intellectual property, where he is actually, he or she is giving your full money's worth? Okay. How do you create that engagement? You used to do town hall in a certain way. You had, you had a certain way of motivating. You had a certain way of compensating. You have so many different ways that... Uh, now are no longer looking relevant. So in this new reality, how do you quickly reorient yourself? And ideally, how do you stay one step ahead of this new reality? You can do that by continuous simulation. Okay? You simulate. Uh, you, we talk about what if. No, We have to continuously think about what if there's a war? What if there's a slowdown? What if my top three guys will run away tomorrow and start a new company? Okay. What if my accountant lies? So what if I have a broken hand? Now, these are non-trivial examples I'm giving you. So if you have, what if I fall sick okay, for the next six weeks? Will my company run? What if, you know, my uh, accountant uh, starts lying and cheating me? Then you begin to understand that the way to preempt that situation is to be invested in governance. Invested in audit, invest, invested in the right amount of tools, invested in going and asking people who are better than you, bigger than you on how they actually handle that piece. Right. And you, you have just a 24 hour day and uh, everything comes with an, you know, time overhead. You have to decide whether, you know, playing that extra round of golf today is more important with your buddy or should you be actually uh, having a breakfast meeting with your competitor this morning to say, how do you do it? Uh, by the way, competitors are people who love to uh, show off. So if you start having breakfast with a competition, you'll learn a lot. 
That's a great input, sir. <clears throat> so on this um, mission to scale up, so what are your advices on some of the common mistakes the IT SME should be mindful about uh, in the customer acquisition strategies and in the hiring strategies based out of your experiences? So I'll tell you, you know, I can go on and on theoretically. The most common mistake is that uh, you, uh, you function far away from your customer. Be in your customer's backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so if you are two founders and both of you are in Bhuvaneshwar while your customer is in uh, North America, I think you are already starting on the wrong foot. Yeah. So split yourself, you know. One of you has to be there. One of you has to be here, right? So the moment you are in the customer's backyard, you will learn many new things. Okay. You will learn with an urgency that you uh, didn't know exists. And uh, when you are in the customer's backyard, then that is where you will realize that you may be actually in what I call a deadly embrace. What's a deadly embrace? You love your customer. You know, the same customer has been giving you business for the last 10 years. You know, your bills get paid. The guy is nice. You host that guy a nice, uh, you know, bottle of red wine when he comes home. Uh, your children know their children, all that good stuff. But in the process, you know, something happens to that customer, then you will, you know, the customer will get uh, COVID, you will also get COVID. Okay. The customer tomorrow suddenly becomes flippant, then there you go. Okay. So you need to look at newer customers and newer customers give you discomfort. You know, they give you a hard time. So how, if you are sitting far away from your customer, you don't know who's your customer's competitor. You need to be doing business with some of your customer's competitors. So I would say that, uh, you know, go far away uh, from your comfort zone, uh, be next, you know, next door to your customer physically, um, invest time in understanding who your customers' competitors are, customers' customers are. How do you start selling to them? And by the way, don't think about selling as something an outsource. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to learn to sell. And you know, you know, uh, you can sell. But you're reluctant. Okay. Selling is extremely critical. So when it comes to um, your experiences, you had this, uh, uh, you had this ability to track customers who were not even willing to work with you. So how did you sort of do that? And um, what are some of these um, things required in terms of uh, the mindset, the, the ability to be so confident that I can go there and get this customer into my company? How does it work, sir? For SMEs, I think this is very important because normally SMEs are slightly apprehensive about reaching out, you know, going out of the comfort zone, like you have said. But what is this quality? What is this mindset that you have that you know that you don't have the expertise? You know that you don't have the skills. And you say that I'm going to get that customer and you go there and get it. How does that happen? So I'll give you one example, you know, uh... When Mindtree started in 1999, we were not in financial services, not in banking. And banking is a, a big segment, as all of you know, and it's very specialized. Um, so it becomes a chicken. Banking, healthcare, they are highly specialized. It becomes a chicken and egg thing. Uh, people don't give you business because uh, you don't have previous experience in uh, working in that sector. And because you don't, you know, they don't give you the business. You don't get the domain knowledge. So you don't, you know, you, you are in a, uh, in a, in a very strange situation. Okay. So we realized that we need to get into banking. 
because we're an internet company at that point in time. And in banking, there are two parts. There is the, the, the bank's core operations. And then you have the outer layer where uh, you, you have the internet enablement. A lot of things have changed since then. So you have to uh, forgive me for giving you what looks like a simplistic example. But at that point in time, in 1999, banks themselves did not know how to internet enable themselves. And the people who ran the core banking, um, you know, IT part of it, these were big companies who also did not have the, uh, would, did not have the, 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 uh, the uh, the ability to quickly master uh, the e-commerce uh, related technologies which were just coming up so we had a great opportunity here to enter through the outer layer or at least get the business for the outer layer but you go to a bank you go to a healthcare company and if you don't smell like uh, you understand the domain uh, that uh, you know you have collectively 5000 man days of experience in that domain, they wouldn't even touch you. So we went to a bank called the Silicon Valley Bank. The Silicon Valley Bank, located in uh, West Coast, California, um, basically prided itself uh, as a bank that funds uh, startups. Okay. Uh, they enjoy working with startups and uh, they uh, really uh, they pride themselves uh, as the startup's uh, preferred bank. Okay. So there's an affinity, there's a cultural affinity there. To a startup basically means a guy who does not know enough. Okay, that's how you're a startup, right? Yeah. So we went to the CIO of the Silicon Valley Bank and a couple of people there that we found some small introduction. And instead of beating our chest on our deep domain capability, we basically said that we don't know anything. Okay. So you surrender. You say, I don't know anything. Okay. So why should Silicon Valley Bank give you business if you don't know anything? So we basically said that we we'll learn at our, our time and our dime. My time, my dime. Okay. But I'll be faithful to you. Uh, you are the bank that, you know, with its golden touch has helped so many startups from the startup state to becoming multi-billion dollar companies. And uh, we want to be adopted by you. We literally use terms like this. And by the way, in every uh, CIO, there's a kind-hearted man or a woman, and sometimes they bring in stray dogs, okay? So you basically present yourself as this cute stray puppy. And we said our problem. Our problem is this. We are planning to go IPO in a couple of years' time, and uh, we don't have a single banking customer. We want to be in the financial services domain. Will you please be our angel? Okay, so everybody requires an angel. You'll be surprised that obviously out of five people to whom you give this pitch, uh, three people will close the door on your face. Okay. One fellow will politely say yes, no, maybe. One fellow surprisingly will say, so here's this tiny pilot I have. Will you, uh, will you be able to you know, take this and show me if you will be able to solve this problem? This tiny one, because the large suppliers will not touch this problem. So try and solve a tiny problem of a large customer and say that I will do it on my time and my dime because I want you to love me. Don't go there, you know, don't go uh, there pretending to be an 800 pound gorilla and don't talk rubbish to them. You go and say, I am the stray puppy. You know, look cute, be adorable, look vulnerable. So that, that you know, in every uh, great decision maker, 
there is an altruistic part there's a nice part and they want to do good they want to take the claim and the credit later on that this guy was a complete nobody when i picked him up and now look you know he's running such a successful company so i think the factor of the true intention and the hunger and the trust that you establish with your customers can help you to diversify into different areas of business within the same customers is that what you're saying no i'm saying that be authentic you know be uh, present yourself don't be shy about areas that you have never tried before go get adapted okay right. and you will be very surprised as to how many such uh, things uh, will come your way let me give you another very interesting example when you go and do that and the customer gives you the tiny problem many of us actually back off saying oh i don't know how to do it i have never done it before okay so i have this favorite story of mine that uh, you know ibm was on the verge of bankruptcy uh this is during the days of the great depression in the last century and the founder of ibm was in deep uh, distress uh the company was about to file bankruptcy and he was uh, not going out of home he was not meeting friends so uh, at that point in time uh, his product was what he thought as a uh, basically a ledger printing device so banks needed to print ledgers and he had made this uh, you know electromechanical device that uh, was capable of uh, printing ledgers and the uh, great depression was time when banks were closing down so if banks are closing down why should they buy laser uh, ledger uh, printing machines so in this situation he was not getting out of home is very sad his wife dragged him forcibly uh, to attend a party and at that party he was uh, very gloomy and glum seated next to him was a chirpy lady and said what do you do so he was bored and he was unhappy so he wanted to dismiss the conversation but broadly describes what he does that he makes this ledger machines and stuff like that so this lady said i really don't understand what this is but i have a hunch that this may be useful to me um i am the chief librarian of the new york uh, city and i have a hard time tracking books okay so this guy the founder of ibm jumped up and said we can do that okay he had no clue right so at least it gives you a monday morning meeting so open that door go figure out you know reposition repurpose yeah find out if you know you can't do it but uh, you can hire a guy from a competitor organization you can get a consultant so when you get the foot in the door you have to be opportunistic this ibm guy was opportunistic mm-hmm. so you need to be authentic number 1 okay number 2 you need to actually let providence present itself don't go with a fixated notion and you know find out this is where the entrepreneurship the innovation the uh, can do attitude kicks in right <clears throat> so the next uh, question i would uh, like to uh, ask you is about um, you know in a growing it smes like you said there are companies which are growing at uh, turnover of 100 crores or more and where there are new sets of people new leaders diversification into different geographies and culture how do they retain the alignment the focus and the agility how do they work together as a team because you know the organization has actually completely transformed but at the same time we it is quite important that they work with her same vision and mission so how do uh, how do what are the tricks for smes to do that well there are no tricks okay um, i don't like the word tricks actually tricks don't work right right um r- running a business however small it is is serious stuff yeah. you have to do things in a consistent manner you have to do them day in and day out 
uh, I always say that the business is not an intangible thing. It is not, uh, uh, you know, it is not something uh, abstract. Business has its own personality. It has ears, eyes. It has a soul. It's continuously listening to you. And it is responding based on how faithful, sincere, authentic you are. And it presents new opportunities. And actually, business many times saves you. You think you are saving the business is the other way around. Yeah. So don't try tricks. Okay. Now, you talk about basically as you grow in size and scale and opportunities, um, how do you retain um, some things which will hold the organization together? Correct. So here we need to step back and talk about what the great man Peter Drucker once said. He talked about constancy of purpose. Businesses uh, must have constancy of purpose. Why were you born? What do you, what do you stand for? This cannot change. And who reiterates continuously the constancy of purpose? It is a leader. It is a CEO. Now, if you look at a company, broadly, there is a pattern. Okay, uh, First and foremost, the company must have a mission that all of us understand. The company must have a vision. Sometimes we change, you know, change these words. We use these words interchangeably. Okay. So we, somebody says vision is the top mission comes from there. Somebody says mission is at the top vision comes from there. Uh, as long as you are consistent, that's fine. So you have your mission, your vision, and based on your mission and vision comes your strategy. Based on the strategy comes your plan. And based on the plan comes your actual implementation. Based on the implementation, or supporting that implementation is your continuous review process. This is how a business is organized. You have a mission, you have a vision, you have the strategy consistent with the mission and vision, you have a annual plan and a rolling three-year plan, and then you have a review mechanism. So as you have, as you experience breakthrough growth, right, some of these may change. What will change is your review process that has to become more dynamic. What has to change is your annual plan. What has to change definitely is your three-year plan. What sometimes must change your vision, but you can't change your mission every two years. Okay, Maybe in five to 10 years, you can change your mission. So some things have to actually continuously change and some things need to have certain stability. But in this whole dance, you think of it as a cosmic dance, okay? In this whole dance, there is something that cannot change. And I have not used that term yet, so I'm going to use it now, so pay attention. What cannot change are your values. Your mission, vision, your strategy, your three-year plan, your annual plan, your review, all these are, you know, relatively dynamic. But what cannot be dynamic every day are your values. Now, what are values? <clears throat> so Peter Drucker has a nice way of putting it. You know, he says that the values are the heartbeat of the organization. Okay. And he also says values are the polar symmetry of an organization. So I have to explain this to you quickly. He gives the example of mother nature. So mother nature early on figured out that the, what is the optimum number of times that a heart must beat? Once she figured that out, she kept that constant in a house fly and a human being. The number of times the heart beats the same. Okay. So why did mother nature do it? She did it because once you figure out what is the optimum heartbeat, you keep that constant so that around it, you can change many different life forms. So some things in life must remain constant so you can change other things around it. Whatever are your organizational values, 
once you know what they are, once you have articulated, you are paying the price for it. Today you are in Bhuvaneshwar or Bhopal. Tomorrow you will be in uh, you will be in Paris and you will be in uh, Singapore. But the organization will practice the same values. The culture may be different, but the values will remain the same. And that is how the organization will scale. So pretty much the same way, Mother Nature found out early on the theory of polar symmetry. All of us in this call, we are symmetric at the poles. Polar symmetry is required for mobility. So once Mother Nature figured out the theory of polar symmetry, she Keeping that as constant created a human being, created a four-legged animal, also created a scorpion and created a centipede. All of us are symmetric at the pole. So the question Peter Drucker asks is, in the organizational context, you know, what is your polar symmetry? What is your heartbeat? So the heartbeat and the polar symmetry, things which you have to keep constant, are the values of the organization. So the top management needs to articulate what are your values and you have to keep, you have to have values as constant. You have to have purpose as constant and then you will be able to manage everything else. Otherwise what happens is an organization does not fail because of external reasons. The organizations typically fail under their own weight. The organization keeps in. We can very happily blame it on Ukraine. We can blame it in COVID. We can blame it on the big guys. We can blame it on that, you know, spiky haired fellow who's actually moonlighting at your expense. Anything. Okay. But the truth is failure to scale happens because organizations actually cave under their own weight. And that happens when you have not paid attention to keeping some things constant. Now, what the, th the thought that will come to your mind is, so what are values? You know, can I do cut and paste? No, you have to deeply introspect what your values are. And sometimes it's not you who will actually decide the values. You have to do it in a collaborative manner. You have to talk with your people. What kind of company are we here to build? What values are things that, that are not actually, they're not uh, negotiable? Once you settle, they're not negotiable. So if, the, if you choose integrity to be a value, then you will hold yourself to the highest standard of scrutiny compared to the lowest person in the organization. So higher you go, the more difficult the scrutiny becomes. And you, you know, the whole organization is then going to see what is the price you are willing to pay for value transgression. Will you look the other way because your spouse has made the value transgression? Will you look the other way because your star marketing guy, your sales guy has made the value transgression? So what price as an entity, as an organization will you pay? And the value conversation cannot happen when you are big. You are, you are big. Okay. The value conversation has to happen when you are very small, when you're just about to begin. Fantastic. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how important it is to, although it is not technology, it is, it, uh, it is not a trick for sure, but value is, I think, the center, it's the backbone of organization, which uh, probably keeps it uh, going uh, further and it really helps to scale up. And this is something which, um, which is very constant as well, because uh, when you look at big organizations, they the first and the thing we talk about is their what is the core value and what is the core purpose. And I think as SMEs also, we should adapt to kind of have some kind of a value and purpose statements for us so that we stick to it no matter what. And that will probably help us in the growth path. Is that right, Mr. So, yeah, you know, uh, Arun, I must tell you something. You know, uh, you other people may be calling you an SME. Don't call yourself an SME, you know. Pretend that you are a very large company. Right. Okay. All of you tried to wear your father's shoes or your mother's high heels. Okay. When your legs were really small, that was a very important exercise. You're telling yourself that, you know, these, the, I will fit into these shoes. 
So pretend, you know, as little girls, we, you know, when mama was not there, we are putting on her dress and trying her lipstick. Okay. As uh, small boys, uh, so I'm, I'm not gender stereotyping here. So, you know, bear with me. Okay. As little boys, we uh, try to, um, you know, pretend we are driving the car or little girls for that matter. We're pretending to drive our parents' uh, vehicle. Okay. Or motorcycle, right? You did vroom, vroom, vroom when it was not even moving. So that pretension is very important. You think that you're big. Don't say I'm small and medium enterprise. Then you will be a, you know, you will be a bonsai. The, you know, be the kitten that does not know that she or he is a cat. Um, you know, you, you are the lion. Even so hold big. yourself to yeah. absolute high standards. Hold yourself to the same standards that a Fortune 500 does. So I'll tell you what, you know, let's pick the example of quality. We think that also because I'm small, I'm SME, I don't have to hold myself to quality standards. Then you will remain an SME all your life. Actually, from M, you will become S. And from S, you'll become M, as in micro. And from M, you will be nothing. Okay. So say I'm not an SME. You say, I, you know... Uh, when uh, Ujiban, which is not a great company now, after the founder left, but when Ujiban was starting as a, uh, as, as a microfinance company, I'm talking about 1999, consistently year after year, they competed for this award called Best Places to Work. And they were the only microfinance company every year to make it to the Best Place to Work uh, list alongside a Microsoft and SAP, very few top end Indian companies made to that list. So Microsoft's of the world, the SAP's of the world, these are the kind of companies that used to uh, make it to that list and Ujiban's name was there. And Ujiban said that we want to be considered in the national league of best places to work. So Ujiban in basically was saying, I don't care. You know, whether I'm not SAP, I'm not, I don't have the muscle power of a Microsoft, doesn't matter. But my human resource policy and practice has to be one of the best in the world. So pretend that you're big. Pretend that you're best. I'll get there. Don't sympathize with yourself. Thank you. Sir, the, we have one problem here. We have the problem of time, actually. So you're and, telling me to shut up and I get no, your message. I'm, I'm not telling you to shut up. I'm just thinking, how do I squeeze in some of the questions that is coming in from the audiences? And then we also have the rapid fire 10 questions for you. So is it possible that uh, I'll give you two questions? Maybe you can very briefly, you have answered most of them already, but very, very briefly, if you can just reiterate one, the first one question is from Mr. Devesh Sinha. What is your opinion about scaling up through inorganic route? What challenges one can foresee by growing the inorganic way? And I'm not telling it for SMEs, but obviously this is a question from our group. You know, personally, I'm not a very big fan of this because uh, uh, we tend to underestimate uh, the, the complexity. And, uh, you know, I would not, if I have to do it, I would not do it as an SME, okay? Uh, you need to be, you need to have the capacity to digest. Takes a lot of top management time, you know. And, uh, you know, so again, just because you are unable to break the glass ceiling, uh, you can't say, okay, why don't I buy a company? You need to uh, get out of your own comfort zone and try to create growth. You need to, uh, you know, you need to continuously say whether or not you are going to sell the company, your own company. Okay. You don't want to sell the company, but you need to say, you know, what do I need to do to look like the most attractive acquisition that is going around for the largest player in my field? So the moment you do that, then you are building on your own. And a time must, must come when you are so large and for a strategic reason, strategic reason, you are damn good in four areas. 
the customer is saying you need complementarity in the fifth area it will take a long time for you to build that so now you bring in that fifth capability it's for a strategic reason with certain amount of organizational depth and capability for which you are admired build that first you know uh, merger acquisition going ipo these are not about you know sleepover these are not about teenage party fantastic advice for smes again um, so just because we have this scarcity uh, of time uh, there is one question which is a very interesting question coming from jayshree mahanti how to politely decline customers for further work and still maintain good relationships for bigger opportunities so that's where the authenticity comes you no know, be authentic and if you want fine morning actually Uh, say no to your customer very unlikely that the customer will uh, will will take it nicely okay so you need to build a mature relationship with your customer continuously share actually in, in all my life as much as i was sharing the transparently sharing the details of my organizational journey with my board with my investors with the press i would do that with my customers and don't talk to customers when the point comes where you have to say yes or no have a regular conversation with the customers okay then what happens is they will understand why you are saying no okay they will say it's fine they will say so i still have the problem can you help me in some other way can you get me somebody else and uh, sometimes uh, you have to say no to a customer uh, because of other reasons and uh, it is important for the for the business that you uh, you know you you part ways and you have to be able to pay the price for it okay right, um oh. every year you should have a list of must win customers and must phase out customers because you many times your customers can create what is called a deadly embrace i have this theory that you you actually inherit the greatness of your customers and also the mediocrity of your customers okay uh, if you have newer customers every time you build newer relationships and you consciously look for customers that can add greater depth and capability because you are doing their work but they may pay you a little less okay i'll still go for those customers because i can learn so here it is we always would say uh, what can i learn from you and what can you learn from me beyond the transaction we'll do with each other right and many of you are from the services business so you need to understand this that um, you know when you execute a customer project you have actually given a piece of your life and time so at the end of it getting paid is one thing but are you emerging taller from that customer engagement if you don't think that that's a possibility then by taking money from that customer you are actually paying a very large price so always seek out customer who will rub off on your hr process will rub off on your marketing ability will be able to add value to you as an individual as a leader as against getting into a deadly embrace with a customer don't work with mediocre customers fantastic. however well paying they are fantastic we have uh, uh, we have very very short time but uh, somia i think we started one or two minutes late you yeah we can we can uh, go ahead by five minutes so um so no, sir um it's uh, very difficult to summarize all that you have said but uh, i think um you started off with uh, giving us the seven or eight different uh, areas where sme should focus on uh, creating the domain the tools the uh, clarity on uh, methodology uh, talking about the quality and quality is how the customers Uh, sort of see it innovation and continuous innovation and uh, about branding and uh, and governance so all these things are very very well taken we talked about the value proposition the 
you know the value system in the organization it's definitely not a trick and it is something very serious that can help organization scale up continuously and i think the semi fraternity here are uh, have really enjoyed the session with you now just before we wrap up this session we ha i have some rapid fire questions for you i would request you to please answer in two to three words if it is possible uh, and i'll start with uh, the first question skill gap is a myth or reality it better always be a reality no otherwise you'll be on a stand still there has to be a skill gap only then you will actually improve your skills what leadership means in the new world authenticity consistency constancy of purpose as i said values 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 one thing that distinguishes good leaders from great leaders i i think it is uh, it is it is um, this good versus great business is uh, is a lot of rhetoric uh, be good be good that's all that matters one be good, be good consistently you will be eventually great great one message for women leader to make it big in their domain you no know, kick all the men real hard <laughs> and don't sympathize with yourself i think women uh, leaders um, uh, they have a much they have much more empathy so um, i'm sure uh, you know with that quality itself they'll go much higher without kicking men yeah so no 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 i i as that uh, that i was do, you know telling metaphorically when i said kick man i'm basically saying uh, kick as in with capability with competence and leadership so don't don't feel inferior feel there is enough great template in front of us okay so uh, you know sbi had a woman uh, chairman arundhati bhattacharya read her book uh, read indranui's book so if indranuis and arundhati bhattacharya is coming from middle class to you know almost like lower middle class families could be where they are in completely male dominated areas um, just the time has come for us to actually not sympathize with ourselves you can the times have changed a lot of things have changed so the next question the most impactful way for smes to ensure a healthy work life balance for their employees you know i think this whole uh, work life balance is another vague thing you know i don't subscribe to it uh, i think we need to be very um, sensitive about people's comfort it is not about work life balance i think we need to create purpose in work when you don't have purpose in work work can become toxic okay so create the purpose in work create the engagement in work and of course be very sensitive and sensitive to uh, people's health issues and be invested in them but most important thing even before you talk about balance etc uh, you create the sense of purpose people will find the balance you create the sense of purpose perfect you get 10 on 10 on that sir what makes a company the best place to work i think uh, trust people must trust you and people must trust each other and trust gets built when sometimes trust are tested fantastic sir the best book you have ever read oh the tons of them i can't say which is the best book i have ever read so just tons one of them or... okay one leader you closely follow and one hallmark of that leader i don't follow any one leader closely and uh, i am inspired by many people many many people um you know but i find that the one quality that is critical and one quality that all the leaders that i admire have is authenticity be authentic authenticity is in short supply and anything in short supply will be in high demand 
be authentic every day be authentic in every transaction be authentic to your spouse to your employee to your supplier be authentic fantastic so what is the best advice you ever got was the best advice i ever got you know i periodically get it from my wife who says shut up i was thinking otherwise <clears throat> like what? i thought you would say go kiss the world uh, no well well you know uh, no that was not an advice uh, that was uh, uh, that i i won't call it an advice i think it was an extortion uh, ex- exhortation it was uh, it was an um, um, it is like she was releasing me into the sky and say she was saying Uh, go this is this is your purpose this is why i gave you birth uh, so this is not an advice okay right. um, she was releasing me um, she was releasing me from herself and she was saying go kiss the world um, no i don't call that an advice okay so the name of your next book Oh, I, I I hope and wish that I can write one more book. Uh, you know, last six years that I've been working with the government, I've been so baked, um, so baked. But even if I had that name, I won't tell you because uh, uh, you know it'll be giving away. Uh, and what if before my book gets published, somebody else takes the name? And by the way, I I I don't have the book nailed down, but I know the name. I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> Okay, so it's good to know something is cooking and um, fantastic time, sir. Thank you very much for Thank you. our invitation, joining us, and it was it has been a great uh, session talking to you, talking to you. I didn't even realize how time has flown, but I uh, will always cherish this time. And uh, good luck, best wishes to you, sir. Thank you very bye much. Bye bye. Take good care. so thank you arun sir i uh, hope this has been a great experience for all of you we wish to thank all of you for attending this workshop